Hello, and welcome to another episode of Marty's Matchbox Makeovers. Today, I am going to be making over this number Y6, which is a yesteryear model, and it uh, it is the 1926 Type 35 Bugatti, and these were produced between 1961 and 1967. It's a 146 scale model, and they came out in blue until 1966 when they changed to the color red. Now this one was a donation from a viewer. It's got three tires missing, a lot of play wear on it with scratched paint and chipped decals. The front bumper there is bent in. You can see that the wheels have minor corrosion issues. Overall, there's not too much damage on the actual body shape itself. The base is loose, which is surprising. I think it's just deformed, probably been stood on or something. So to begin with, I'm going to take that base off, just using a suitably sized drill to remove the end of these rivets or posts that hold the base into position. Now all this took really is half a second, almost just two turns of the drill, and it removed the rim of that post that was holding the base on. So that was really easy. The front one, however, was a little bit more difficult, so I had to resort to using a shallow cut drill, uh, slightly oversized as well, to remove the edge of that rivet post, so I could remove the base easily. So now that I've done that, I'm using this small flat bladed screwdriver. Here you can see I keep all my knives and screwdrivers, etc., just plunged into a piece of polystyrene. I can't see what's on the other end, so for the screwdrivers, I've marked them with a silver pen to denote which type of screwdriver they are. So using this very small flat bladed screwdriver, I remove the base. The front came off really easily. The back was a little bit stubborn, but that's all good. If it's difficult to put back together, that's a bonus because it means it's not going to fall apart easily. After I removed the base, I found some threads hidden in there. Seems a bit strange, but I picked those out. Closely followed by the steering wheel and seat assembly. There's a lot going on there with this. I'll have a look at that in detail in a minute. Now this spare wheel here is held on by what I can only call a small nail. Not too sure that would pass the current toy standards. If some kid managed to pull that out, they'd be all hell to pay. The front axle's bent as well, hence the wheel is not sitting properly. And that tire's got a bit of a gouge on it. Now I don't have any spare tires, so I'm gonna have to remove that one very carefully so I can reuse it. And I'm gonna 3D print some additional ones because I've got a second model of this model, <laughs> second model of this model to do. So I'm, I'm gonna print some 3D tires off for both models, but I, you won't be seeing the other one in this video, just this one. Now I'm having to cut the front axle off because there wasn't much protruding at the end, so I had nothing to work with to try and get the axle out undamaged. So I just cut it in half with those side cutters. It's still quite tough to get out. There you can see it's bent. So just as well I'm replacing it. I've got a box of spare axles that I use in this instance. Uh, in these circumstances, I just fish one out. Now after cutting that axle in two, I just bin it. Now here's a close-up of the rear axle. You can see there's a quite a protrusion there. Uh, beyond the limits of the wheel, so I can use my Dremel and the grindstone to get that rim off that axle and remove the axle. I'll do that now. This is an unusual shaped model, so it's quite difficult to clamp it securely. So this is quite loose in the jaws there. I didn't want to crush the model up and make it all out of shape. So just using that Dremel again on the, the cylindrical grindstone, I wear away the end of the axle and that releases the wheels like that. I love it when it works. 
Now, I keep all the parts together in these disposable food containers so they don't end up falling on the floor or disappearing. Now, this gear shifter, handbrake, whatever it is, I'm not 100% sure. I'm not familiar with the Bugatti. I've never driven one. That's held in with another squashed rivet head. And I'm just going to take that off again with the cylindrical grindstone. I'm trying to be as careful as possible, though. I don't damage the interior of the vehicle too much. Because I'm not too sure if it's going to be visible when the seats are back in position. So I'm just taking off the barest minimum amount of metal there. And I just get my, hook my nails behind this little lever there. It's, it's a bit of effort. Just work it away and eventually it comes apart. Now check this out. This is so tiny, this little thing. It's even got a little release lever on the end there. The detail in these models is incredible. I'll put that in the food container. Now that nail I was talking about, when I looked at it, I was convinced it had a couple of burrs on it. Turns out it was just balls of fluff. And this is basically literally just forced into the model. There's nothing restraining it other than friction between the sides of the nail and the interior of the hole. So in theory, I should just be able to push it out with some long nose pliers, I'm thinking. Although it has been there for 50 odd years. Maybe more, because it's nearly 60, I think. And it hasn't come out. And I noticed it was, wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. So going through my box of nuts, I found this beautiful little gold one that was singing out to me. I felt this is the one. I've placed the nut over the end of the axle, and now I'm squeezing the tip of the axle from inside there with the long nose pliers. And I'm hoping it's going to move into the nut. And there we go. That plan worked out perfectly. So now I can just remove the nut and give this one half millimeter nudge with the long nose pliers. And that nail has come out. So this is the spare wheel. And this one also has some corrosion issues. Put that aside for later. Now, just having a look at this interior, I noticed the seat is plastic. The steering wheel is held in with a, again, it's been peened over on the end. So I'm going to leave that there. No, not necessary to remove it. This seat is loose. It's a plastic assembly pressed into a hole in the metal base there. And it's quite easy to remove. Like any kid could have pulled that out, I reckon, if they just tried a little bit. Now, trying to get these tires off, I'm worried I'm going to break them. I don't want to do that. So it's time to go in the kitchen and boil the kettle. So I'm going to heat these tires up so they're a little bit soft. And hopefully I can remove them easier with finger pressure and uh, take them off undamaged. I polished the kettle, especially for this scene. So I just pop those wheels and tires into the near boiling water. And hopefully they will be softened enough for me to remove with finger pressure without damaging them. Now the water's that hot, I need tweezers to get them out. It's not exactly boiling though. But as you can see, the tires come off very easily once uh, they've warmed up a little bit. Hmm famous last words now there we go that worked well so add those to the mix now I'm just trying to make up a sticker I'm gonna have to make some new stickers on my computer so I'm just taking some initial measurements here that said 7.2 but I wrote down 7.1 because I think I wasn't quite so I'm just using these calipers here to measure I wrote down 7.1 there instead of 7.2. Don't ask me why. Now it's time to mix the paint. I've got to match the paint before I strip the old paint off. In the past, I've done it in the wrong order and it gets a bit difficult to do. So I guess I've learnt from my mistakes. So using the sky blue Tamiya paint and some white. I'm going to try and mix up the same colour as the original paint. 
And I ran out of white paint here, so I rushed down and bought a new pot. This is the new pot. You wouldn't have spotted that if I hadn't told you. Now, using a cotton bud, I just touched the paint onto the model there. And as you can see, it is too light. So, unfortunately, all my efforts are in vain. I've now got to make it darker by adding a couple of drops of black. Choose a different section to put it on here so I don't get confused. Now, that looks a little bit light also. So, again, another drop of black. I'm near. I'm close. Now, I'm looking at that, and I'm thinking the shade looks really good, but it is a little bit light. Now, somebody once told me, when you heat paint up or when it dries, it dries a couple of shades darker. So to test that theory out, I quickly put this in my little toasty oven and heated it up after about five minutes. The paint was dry, and I took it out, and I was quite pleasantly surprised that, yes, indeed, when it dried, it did go a little bit darker. And here you can see it is so close that I think I am happy with that. So I'm just thinning it down now with some water-based acrylic thinners. And I'm capping the shot glass off with some brown masking tape there to keep the paint fresh for when it comes time to paint the model. So I set that aside now and continue on. Now before I paint strip, I'm going to tap these holes I've got these tiny little 2M button screws. They're, got, they're Allen headed, which means you need a little hex key to insert them and remove them. Now, I've realized just recently that I have a mix of these, and there's actually two types. And this one, the thread is 2 millimeters in diameter. So I'm using a 1.8 millimeter drill to drill out the hole. And I'm not going to tap the hole as such using a separate tool. I'm going to merely drive the screw into the hole because I feel that there will be sufficient room there for the screw to cut its own thread. This is the first time I'm going to try this. Uh, this metal is pretty soft as it is and I can't see any reason why it shouldn't work. In this little clip, it doesn't show you, but I do actually go down quite deep into those posts. And then I use this lovely little makeup brush that I found in our ensuite I didn't know I had. It's perfect for wiping swarf and metal filings away into the bin. Here's the two types of screw I'm talking about. As you can see, the shank is slightly wider on one and the Allen key is slightly different. It's that close that the Allen keys actually look the same size when they're next to each other. So anyway... This is the smaller one of the two. And like I said, I am now merely screwing this into the hole I drilled before. And it has cut its own thread and is locked in there quite tightly. So that's a little win there. I might use that method in future. The interior of the car is red. I found this Carmine Red number 467. Mr. Hobby color and it's the exact same color straight out of the pot. Unfortunately, it's a matte paint, so I'm going to have to give it a varnish at a later date. Now, Julie borrowed my paint stripper and she lost the lid to the can. So I've had to resort to having it in this food container till I buy some more. Um, but it's not all bad news because I have been able to now dunk the parts into the paint stripper and get overall coverage immediately. Whereas before, I was having to fish it out with a, a paintbrush and paint it on or, or just tip it out of the jar. It was quite wasteful. So this way, I'm actually, I guess, not using quite as much paint stripper as I was in the past. So thank you, Julie, for losing the lid of the paint stripper can. Now, I just agitate this paint stripper with a disposable, if you like, paintbrush. I actually do wash it out, and I keep this paintbrush just for this purpose. I don't use paint on it ever. And I just agitate the paint until it comes loose, and then I scrub it off with a toothbrush, 
uh, in the kitchen sink. In the uh, actually today, I'm in the ensuite bathroom. Now this is the bent front section here. Obviously, it's supposed to be straight, and on this side here, that front portion is bent in because it's been dragged in by the bending of the, the horizontal part there. So I'm going to use this tiny little blowtorch that I've got. It's a great thing if you haven't got one, get one. They're magnificent. Puts out a lot of heat. And you'll see exactly how much heat it puts out in any second now. Because I'm just touching this with it very gently. Now I'm trying with these flat bladed screwdriver, a larger one this time. And it doesn't want to move. So I heat it again just there. You can see a little blister of metal appear. And I've actually melted the melted the, the metal. So I went a little bit too hot there. And if you look at it, it's like reminds me of the crust on uh, molten lava. It's kind of lifted the surface off momentarily. Anyway, it's set back into solid metal. So using this small hobby file, I'm filing it back to try and disguise the damage. And um, it actually worked out quite good. And I don't think anyone would know that I had heated that up and melted it and then had to file it back into shape. So now I've done that, I'm going to give them a quick coat of this Tamiya Fine Surface Primer, light grey. One of my favourite products. It goes on so beautifully smooth and fine that it doesn't obscure any detail on the model. And I'll show you after I've painted them what, what, how much detail there is. Uh, it's phenomenal. On this particular car, there's so much detail on it. It's incredible. It's a pleasure to look at. Normally as a kid, you wouldn't notice. But when I've been doing these up over the years, I noticed through magnifying devices just how intricate they are and how well made they are. And all these details are, have never been seen before with the naked eye because kids used to just push them around on the carpet. They probably never even gave it a second thought that there was uh, tiny rivets and things like that on them. The base there I painted with some satin black. I don't bother undercoating the bases. It's just something I do. Now these wheels with the corrosion and a bit of gunk in there in the spokes. One of them is particularly bad. I'm going to chuck them in this ultrasonic cleaner for 15-20 minutes. And see if it can work some magic. So I've got a little plastic basket in there that I put the pieces in. There it is there. Now I've switched it on. You can't really see much happening but the ultrasonic cleaner is on. And I guess it's sending ripples of cleansing waveforms through the liquid. Now, have a look at the details on this model. You can see the rivets and a multitude of ventilation uh, slots to keep the engine cool. The front radiator there is just a masterpiece of engineering, how fine that cross hatching is. It's got a radiator cap and a fuel cap there at the back. I'll probably paint that silver at the end. And there, there's a, a sort of a raised circular rim there. And that's where that decal goes. It must have been an aid for the people in the factory when they were assembling them to get them all consistently in the same place. Now, inside the interior, the steering wheel's a little bit awful. I mean, a little bit ordinary, I should say. I've got to clean some of that flashing off. But there's actually a multitude of instruments on that dashboard there, like speedometer, rev counter, temperature gauge. Who knows? There's all sorts of stuff there. It's brilliant. Now these seats are filthy dirty, so I'll give them a clean in just some warm water with some washing up liquid in it. And it comes up really good. Look at that. I still give it a coat of varnish just to top it off, but it probably wasn't necessary. So this thing's been going for 15 minutes now, so I take these wheels out, I shake the basket into a sieve, so I don't sort of get the cleaning fluid everywhere. I go over to my bench and lay them out and inspect them. Just put them on some squares of kitchen paper that I have available. I spend 10 minutes a week cutting up kitchen paper into little squares and just storing them in the hobby room because they're handy to have. And, uh, well, have a look at that. Fairly ordinary detail there, but uh, still... A beautiful little wheel that has been well made. So these were gold originally. So I've got this Tamiya gold leaf. 
paint and uh, I haven't got much of this left either. I have no idea what I've used this for. I can't, surely I can't have used a whole pot. I don't even know what I've used it for. Anyway, I have, so I'll have to get some more. So I just hold them in position with the cocktail stick lightly and uh, as I paint them, they turn automatically and they're very easy to paint and very easy to get in amongst all those spokes as well. So I do the backs first and let them dry and then I flip them over and do the front and then I store them in this just a block of foam that I've glued to a bit of card for stability and I just poke them in there and set them aside to dry. Now this is thirsty work so I have a, a quick half a beer and then soldier on. Here's the paint I mixed up yesterday but now is today. My airbrush, I'd like to tell you what brand it is, but it's got no markings on it whatsoever. I just bought it from the local hobby shop, along with a standard uh, compressor, and it served me well for the last two years. I should get another one, actually, just in case this one becomes worn out. Now, this is the blue paint I put on. I also had added a splash of the Mr. Hobby leveling fluid to give it a nice high shine. The interior, of course, as, as I said, I'm painting it with this carmine red matte paint. And as I mentioned before, I've cleaned up the steering wheel spokes with a small file. So I've removed the flashing and made them look a little bit more neater, so to speak. There's a test spray on the newspaper there. Seems to be going on well. Maybe a little bit too thick, but a nice coverage there and a beautiful red colour. I'm going to repaint the steering wheel gold when this is dried to make it like the original. Now this little gear stick, I paint that gold. Lovely little item that, so detailed and so small. No, it's not even a centimetre long. So here you can see that was matte paint I used. So I'll give it a quick coat of this TS13 Tamiya Clear, which again is a popular uh, product of mine that I use continuously for all sorts of things that I recommend. Look at that. That gives a beautiful finish. And very seldom does it let me down. Now I'm going to make these decals uh, seven millimeters they've got to be in diameter. Now I've got my punch set out and I've got 10, 9, 8, then 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 or there. Something like that. There is no 7. Can you believe it? That's the one I wanted. So I end up going for the 8 mil. And 8 mil, although it's oversized, it's going to extend by, what, half a mil on each side. So I punch a bit of card out there, and that's what it looks like. I'm doing a test fit now on that little circle to see if it's going to look too big. And I actually think it looks all right. So I'm going to go with the 8 mil. Better that than the, than the 9 or the 6. So I'd like seven, but I didn't have the punch. So I print these out on my computer. I, just from a photograph I took of the original one. And I print them on some white-backed decal paper, which is available on eBay. It came from China. It took like a month to get here, but worth, worth getting. And the thing with this is, after you've, print, print, uh, after you've printed on it, you have to spray the printed area with some varnish so I use again the Tamiya varnish and that stops the ink from bleeding when you put them in the water now I'm using this gold pen for something different I used the gold leaf before now I'm using the gold ink pen from Pentel and I'm just painting the detail on the steering wheel here with a brush and this was harder than you think because I'm trying not to get it on the dashboard and it's very awkward to see behind the steering wheel to see whether you've coated the, the spokes on the back. So it took longer than I thought. But there's a close-up of it, the finished item. I hope you like it. Now using this punch, I'm going to try cutting out some of these numbers.
using a paintbrush, I poke it out at the end there because it gets uh, hold, held in there by friction. And that's what it looks like. The only downside is I've damaged my cutting mat a little bit. That's, you know, you don't, you can't, oh, what's the saying? You can't make an omelette without breaking an egg or something like that. Um, so I just put a little bit of moisture on the model using some tweezers because these things are fiddly. Look at my hands shaking. I'm nervous here. I need another beer. So I just very gently drag the backing sheet out from underneath the decal. And then I don't recommend this, but using a toothpick, there is a risk of tearing the decal using a toothpick, but I panicked at the time. I needed to rotate that a couple of degrees because it wasn't quite on right. But uh, um, worked out okay in the end. And I used the cotton bud there just to squeegee out any excess moisture from behind the decal. And there is the other one done. And I, once again, I'm happy with that. Now I'm just going to set that aside. And when those decals are 100% dry, I'm going to just coat them with some of that clear varnish again. Just to seal those edges of the decal so they don't come off. Here's another look at the wheels. Now I managed to print off some 3D printed tires. So three of these are 3D printed and two of them are the originals. So here's all the parts ready to put back together. I've managed to source a new front axle from my axle box. And I'm out in my shed now and that's why the lighting has changed somewhat. It's just daylight coming through the door there. I hope you can see. Using my drill press method, I then reform the end of the axle. Uh, it doesn't need much because they're quite a tight fit, these axles in that hole. Just enough there to hold the wheel on. Now, the front one there didn't have a lot of excess material, and I risked damaging the wheel with the nail, the spinning nail in the drill press so i opted to peen the end with a ball pane hammer on this one so it has the same outcome it's just a different way of doing it so if you haven't got a drill press get yourself a ball pane hammer now putting this nail back in i thought oh well this would be a breeze i'll just place it there and tap it in with a few light taps even maybe press it in but no it was a very very tight fit I tried squeezing it in using these long nose pliers, but I had to offset them. And the whole thing became unbalanced trying to do it like that. Now I tried to tap them in with the long nose pliers because, as you know, in the absence of a hammer, any tool will do. But that didn't work. I only got it in so far. So I thought, how the heck am I going to get this thing back in there without damaging the model? So I had this one inch, it says it's one inch, it's a lot more than one inch. But it's a tiny little Chinese uh, G-clamp I bought from the $2 shop. I don't think I've ever used it. But I went and got it and I modified it by removing the cup on the end of the screw threaded part. And I glued a nut onto the flat face of it. And I modified the profile of it by grinding it with a grindstone to get it to fit inside the model. And lo and behold... It's a perfect press for this little nail. I just turn it gently and it pushes it straight in. Don't go too tight. I don't want to damage that wheel. And voila, that is held securely in place and hopefully will be there for another 60 years. And all wheels turn freely, which is good. So I've just got to put the other bits back on now. The gear, shift, lever, and handbrake. I guess that's what it is. Someone will let me know, I'm sure. So I put some paper tape on the end of the tip of the long nose pliers there so I didn't damage this small component. And that locked in beautifully. It's solid. Can't even rotate it with finger pressure. Feels like it's going to break if you try and force it. So that's, uh, that's a good outcome. The interior and the steering wheel and the seat go back in. I'm getting excited now because I can see the end product in sight. 
Now, I had to work out which way this went. Uh, that way or this way? Yeah, that way. Good. Now, for the first time, I've realized that the front axle is exposed in the final model. Now, I damaged it slightly by holding it with some pliers whilst reforming the end of the axle there. So, I'm going to paint that with some silver paint to make it look nice. Put these color match screws in, and they screw up really tight. That's a great tip, that. Using them to cut the screw thread worked really well. So now I've just got to touch up a few highlights. I've painted the fuel cap silver. Not because it was on the original, but it's just my little spin on it. I thought it needed to be silver. Uh, but the grill was definitely gold in the original. So I'm just painting the grill again with the ink from the gold pen. And trying to get it as neat as possible, which is never an easy thing. And so let's have a reminder as to what this looked like before we started. And I must admit, this makeover took longer than I thought it would. I've also been doing other chores around the house whilst doing this, so I apologise for the delay. Anyway, as you can see, it's a bit tatty looking. Three tyres missing, a bit of corrosion. And voila, this is what it looks like now. It's got some beautiful 3D printed tyres on there, which I've glossed up with a bit of black wash. The gold wheel hubs and steering have been repainted. The red interior. The, the silver fuel cap looks great. The new decals. And a complete new blue, matching blue colour. I think this thing looks a million dollars. As I've said before, these yesteryear models by Matchbox, each and every one of them is definitely a work of art. They are absolutely beautiful models. And I get a thrill out of doing up every single one of them. And I can't wait to put this one in my display case along with the others, as another gem in my collection of miniature models. Thank you all for watching. I hope you've enjoyed this video. And if you have, please like and subscribe. And until next time, this is Marty saying, see you later.